Now that we've explored what interest groups are and reasons why people might choose to join an interest group and the impact they can make, we're now going to explore some of the various strategies they have in terms of gaining influence. And interest groups really do wield an enormous amount of interest in American democracy, for better or worse. We're going to pay special attention to how interest groups can influence elections. A lot of times they'll support a candidate for public office. We're going to explore how they can influence the decisions that are made in Congress and even influencing the courts. It would be impossible to talk about interest groups without pointing out that they have enormous power when it comes to funding. And American interest groups spend all kinds of money on donations to political candidates and political parties. In American democracy, special interests pay collectively vast sums of money to influence government. In 2022, which was a midterm election year, all the Congress members were up for re-election and a third of the senators. Just among the top 50 categories of interest groups, over $1.2 trillion was donated to congressional campaigns. And that wasn't even in a presidential election year where we typically see more people turning out to vote and more money being spent on the election. And that's just for members of Congress. You know, these interest groups are active at multiple levels of government and not just looking at Congress. So when we talk about donations by interest groups to politicians, we are literally talking about trillions of dollars in an election year. And many citizens just feel that that is just way too much influence on who wins elections. And importantly, how are the politicians going to vote once they get in office? It can be really hard to measure the impact of this spending. We obviously assume that it gives these groups an advantage. Otherwise, why would they be doing it? But it's also kind of hard to know how many minds they're changing in Congress. And one of the reasons for this is, let's say you're an interest group and you're really concerned about an issue. You're likely only going to be giving money to candidates that already agree with you. You're not going to be spending a lot of money on somebody who has completely different views. But donations do count for a lot. They help members of Congress and other politicians get elected and reelected, and they can really open up some doors to access to members of government. If you make a large campaign contribution, maybe that member is going to be more likely to take a meeting with you. I would say that's probably the case. Now, interest groups representing individual citizens or big corporations or trade associations, they can all donate their money either to directly to a candidate or to a political party. And some groups tend to favor incumbents. Incumbents, of course, are the people already in office. And it's because they've proven that they can win. And guess what? They already have influence. If you're an incumbent member of the Congress, you probably have some influence in terms of what laws are passed and which ones are defeated. And while most interest groups are going to donate to candidates who see eye to eye on the issues, there are some groups that sort of play both sides. Maybe you're going to donate half of your money to the Republicans and half of your money to the Democrats in the hopes that regardless of who gets elected, you're still going to have some access and some goodwill with that member. Now, it's not just a free for all, at least it's not supposed to be. And so um, there are some rules around how much can be donated and how that's done. So uh, interest groups will often start something called a political action committee or a PAC. And that's going to be a group that has the legal authority to collect money from donors. And uh, they can distribute that money to political candidates. So each PAC can donate up to $5,000 per candidate per election. There's no limit to how many individuals they can support. So they can literally support hundreds of members, say, for congressional reelection. They can also make a donation to a political party up to $15,000 per year to that party. Now, each individual, say you were really interested in politics and you wanted to cut a check to one of these PACs, uh, you as an individual, you'd be able to give them up to $5,000 per year. So why do we have to go through this system? And one of the reasons is for transparency's sake. Uh, all of this stuff is public record. And so when you make a donation, uh, when, a, when a PAC makes a donation to a candidate, that all has to be reported to the federal government, and it's essentially public information. Anybody can look into it and see where those sources of money are coming from. More on that in our next video. So clearly, money can make a big difference in whether somebody gets elected or not and how effective their campaign is going to be.
But there are other ways that interest groups play an impact in terms of elections as well. And one of those is by doing these scorecards of politicians. Now, a lot of interest groups will actually have this strategy of publishing ratings or grades for members of Congress or other politicians. And they'll actually say, you know, we think that this politician is getting an A plus or we think this politician is doing a lousy job. They're getting an F. So a low rating could do a couple of things. Let's say that you are getting a low rating from an interest group out there. It might make you think twice in terms of how you're going to vote next time because maybe you want a high grade. Right. So there's just a little bit of pressure that it puts on the member. But another thing that it can do is it can really signal to voters when it's time to go and choose the candidate for office. Does this person align with my views or not? So it's also a way of educating the public on the stance of the politician. Now, a lot of time, interest groups will even come out and endorse a candidate for a position, too. Let's say there's a close Senate seat or even presidential race. You might have a union or uh, some sort of other uh, interest group come out and say, we are endorsing so-and-so for president or for Senate. That actually like leading their brand name to that candidate as well. And as a voter, if you trust that organization, that's a really solid cue for you that maybe this candidate would be somebody you'd like too. Let me give you a couple examples going back to the scorecard idea. And uh, this is going to have to do with the issue of abortion. And we're going to be looking at our local Congress member, the one who actually represents Los Angeles Harbor College. And that's going to be uh, Representative Ted Lieu, who's a Democrat here from California. Now, Planned Parenthood has their own interest group, and it's called the Planned Parenthood Action Fund. And one of the things that they do is they give a ranking to every member of Congress to see how aligned is the Congress member with the views of Planned Parenthood on issues relating to abortion and um, other things within the purview of their organization. So in addition to abortion, there's also going to be a big focus on contraception and family planning and so forth. So if you look at Ted Lieu, uh, you're going to see that Planned Parenthood Action Fund gave him a 100% rating. Uh, in terms of his job performance as a member of Congress. Now, their website says that for a, a member of Congress to earn that score of 100%, the member must always vote with Planned Parenthood Action Fund's position on the legislation listed. So if you're somebody who considers yourself pro-choice, this might be a candidate that you could really get behind. Now, I'm also going to show you um, another organization. That's going to be Susan B. Anthony, Pro-Life America. Uh, and as you can imagine, this is going to be a pro-life organization. It probably will not surprise you to find out that they've given Ted Lieu an F. And it's for all the same reasons. He's a very pro-choice candidate. So pro-life organization would definitely not recommend him. After all, he voted in opposition to their stance on the same bills that came before Congress. However, if you look at other members of Congress, like in this case, we've got uh, Republican Senator Rand Paul from the state of Kentucky. They've given him an A plus rating because he tends to vote more in line with pro-life policies. So if you're somebody who's pro-life, you might be inclined to support this candidate. So it kind of um, does a couple of things. Number one, puts that pressure on the member. And number two, it can also be a real uh, source of information for you when you're going to vote and deciding what issues are the most important to you. So a few other ways that they would influence members of Congress would typically be to have a meeting with a Congress member or their staff. Uh, years ago, I served as a staff member for a member of Congress representing part of California. And we would often have groups that would try to schedule an appointment with the Congress member. And if they couldn't get in with the Congress member face to face, they would like to sit down with people like me and other members of the staff to talk about the issues that they cared about. We called those constituent groups. And there were all kinds of groups, everybody from the real estate organization to people who cared about foreign policy, uh, lots of different interests, and they all want access. And the reason they want access is to be able to advocate for their views and tell the Congress member what they'd like to see happen. And so oftentimes these groups, especially the powerful groups, are really going to be targeting the most powerful and influential members of Congress, especially if they serve on a related committee. Going back to our example of Lockheed Martin, let's say that, you know, they want to make some changes. It doesn't make sense for them to go to the Agriculture Committee. They have nothing to do with agriculture. They're going to go to the Armed Services Committee. They're going to go to the Appropriations Committee. Why? Because those are the ones having to do with military and the budget. So if you're a member of Congress and you serve on one of those committees, odds are pretty good that you're going to get a knock on the door or a phone call from one of these organizations. 
Now, it's not always just asking for stuff. Sometimes they have some valuable information to share with the member as well. So one of the ways that they can influence Congress is by sharing information. A lot of times groups will have a real keen idea of the way that certain policies are going to affect their specific group. So they'll tell the member what they think. How would this be a good law? Would this be a bad law? And that can be really helpful, especially when it comes to highly technical topics. Remember, uh, Congress members can't be an expert on everything, so they do rely on these groups to give them accurate information. The groups can also sometimes give them information that might help in the re-election campaign. So let's say they have some polling data that says your constituents, the people who voted to put you into office, here's what the polls say they believe on this issue. And that might be really helpful for the member, not only to get a sense of what the people in the community wants, but in order to also get reelected. So there is that element of providing information that could be helpful. So we'll talk about two more types of influence that interest groups can have on Congress. And it's kind of, I don't know, disturbing to think about for me personally, but interest groups can often be the ones who actually write the legislation. Now, Congress members and their staff are supposed to do that. That's part of the job description. Um, however, it's true that lobbyists and the attorneys that they work for can sometimes propose bills, uh, maybe outlining what they would like to see the policy look like. And there have even been um, studies where they've gone in and they found that some of the stuff that makes it into law is written verbatim by these um, interest groups. So they'll actually have an outside group draft up the law with their attorneys, uh, give it to the Congress member, and then that Congress member will introduce that as a piece of legislation. That does happen. Now, finally, uh, the last way that we're going to look at that these interest groups can influence Congress is mobilizing to defeat certain bills. Uh, when a new bill or a proposal comes out, maybe a new policy, uh, if that threatens the group's interests, they can put pressure on Congress members to defeat the bill. A really clear example of this happened back in 2017 when the Federal Communications Commission was considering some new rules about regulating the internet. And they were going to pass this policy where internet service providers, say like your Comcast and Charter and these other big companies, AT&T, um, instead of treating all of the information that flows across the internet equally, they were going to essentially prioritize some of that data transmission for people who could pay for it. So big companies being able to pay more and they would have faster internet speeds. Now the ISPs like that, the internet service providers, because um, they said it would help their businesses be more efficient. But there were a lot of tech companies who really didn't like this idea. And so they decided to mobilize to try to defeat this policy. And the way that they did that was by blasting the message out everywhere they could. So you had big social media companies like Reddit and Twitter uh, posting notices on their front page, other tech uh, websites like GitHub, even Netflix got in on it. And they were telling people, call your member of Congress, tell them you do not want this policy. So what did they see? They saw a pending proposed policy and they mobilized. They tried to get people to put pressure on Congress to defeat that policy. That's a great example. Now, we could spend a lot of time talking all about how interest groups affect the various three branches of government. We're kind of going to skip over the executive branch for a bit and look at how interest groups can also influence the courts. One way that they can do this is by endorsing people when judge positions open up. Now, when somebody becomes a federal judge, they have that job for life, whether it's on one of the lower courts or at the U.S. Supreme Court. And so interest groups often have an interest in making sure that people who align with their values are selected for the job. Now, one example of this was back during the Trump administration. There was an opening on the Supreme Court and Donald Trump had to pick somebody for the seat. And so he picked a woman named Amy Coney Barrett, who was a judge at uh, one of the federal courts. When he did this, many interest groups had an opinion on Amy Coney Barrett's uh, selection. And you had uh, conservative interest groups like the Heritage Foundation endorsing Amy Coney Barrett for Supreme Court. Now, the Heritage Foundation spent a lot of time, money, and effort really advocating for Amy Coney Barrett to fill that seat. So they did things like running a national TV ad campaign. They had people from their organization doing interviews all over the media. They even launched a podcast that people could listen to about the candidate. And they organized all kinds of events really trying to convince 
U.S. senators to vote for her, and also trying to get the public at large to support her nomination. So as you can see, the interest groups really do have an interest in who gets on to the courts. Now, another thing that they'll do, and we'll explore this more when we get to our chapter on the courts, but interest groups regularly file briefs in court. And this is especially important once you get to the appeals level and to the U.S. Supreme Court. There's a tradition in the American court system that when you have a big case, you can have different interest groups filing briefs and describing how they view the case. We call these amicus curiae briefs, which means a friend of the court brief. And essentially, the organization is able to lay out uh, what they would like to see happen and how they view the case. So one example of this would be back in uh, the landmark Supreme Court case Obergefell versus Hodges. Now, this is a case where the U.S. Supreme Court said that the 14th Amendment guarantees a right to marriage regardless of sex. So uh, that essentially legalized same-sex marriage in all 50 states. Now, one of the parties that brought forward a brief in the case was the Human Rights Campaign, which is an organization that focuses on LGBTQ rights. And they filed a brief in that case saying that the 14th Amendment guaranteed equal protection when it came to laws regarding marriage. The Supreme Court agreed with that reasoning and, in their opinion, uh, essentially argued the same thing. So we can see that there are ways that interest groups can even get involved, not only in Congress, but also with the courts. I hope you found this video interesting. I look forward to seeing you at our next and final video uh, for this week. I'll see you there.